But you got Eric Dadman, CJ Swelly, and Dave Swan. Hey guys, good to see you. Hi. Hey, what's going How's on? How's it going? Hey Nick. <laughs> Uh, we've got another exciting panel happening here uh, at PitchCon. Oh, I have to change the banner. I'm, I'm changing the banner now. And this is going from the positive stuff to maybe the negative stuff, the ones that we're going to be avoiding here. I do want to give a massive shout out that I forgot to um, for uh, we got an anonymous $1,000 contribution, which is unbelievable. Uh, I happened in the middle of the previous panel. I, I didn't catch it. Um, thank you so much for that. We have some great ones too. John, 25, Eric at 50. Uh, we have Brian at 50 as well. Steve at 50. Thank you all so much for uh, contributing. We're up to 3,800. We're only 1,200 away from our day two goal of $5,000 to get us halfway to our $10,000 goal. So thank you, everybody. If you're wondering where to contribute, go to pitchrust.com slash pitchcon to do it on the site. There's a giant contribute button. Without further ado, take it away, guys. Thank you so much for being a part of PitchCon. All right. Thanks, Nick. We're hoping to keep it rolling here uh, in the 4 o'clock hour of day two with this panel, which is called Guys We Refuse to Draft in 2023. So it's, like Nick said, kind of on the negative side, but we're not talking about guys that we refuse to take at any price. Uh, those aren't necessarily the guys we want to be talking about or that you want to hear about. We're going to be talking about guys that, at the price that we currently have to pay, given their ADP, guys that we just don't expect to get on our teams, prices that we are not willing to pay right now. And uh, I'm Eric Dadman. I'll be uh, your moderator for this uh, this panel. Uh, my, I work on the reliever team at Pitcher List, but I've got two other great guests here with me uh, that I'd like to introduce now. So first is another contributor to Pitcher List, Steve Giswelli. Steve, how's it going? Good, Eric. Uh, great to be on this panel with you guys. Uh, it's it's an honor to be a part of this for you know, a great cause, obviously, and happy to take it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of negative, right? Like, uh, it's guys we don't like. So uh you know uh it, it hopefully uh th there's some landmines that we'll 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 tip you off on and avoiding but uh excited to be a part of it and, and talk some shop with you guys yeah we'll try and uh, maybe throw some alternatives out there like if yeah. we're if we're out like on it. this one guy who is an alternative we could take just to throw some positivity in there maybe um and our other panelists our second panelist another contributor here at picture list dave swan dave how's it going hey eric it's doing really good Glad to share the panel with you guys, especially since, you know, your two writers that I read, you know, quite often the reliever ranks and Steve, you know, I've told you, I listen to the Winds of a Fantasy podcast is, is one of those ones that when it comes out, it gets like a, a first day listen. So appreciate you guys. Wonderful. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. The way we're going to organize this is we're going to just start off by going through the rounds in general. So like first round, top 15 picks, we're going to talk about who are we out on? Who is the guy currently being drafted in the first round that we do not think should be drafted in the first round? And then we'll go the first 30 picks, two-ish rounds, and we'll kind of expand out from there uh, and for as much time as we can, uh, as much time as we get. So let's start with the first round. The first round, within the first 15 picks, just so you can follow along at home, we're looking at draft champions leagues right now uh, from January 1st to January 24th. Uh, when we started talking about, and we wanted to, you know, lock in those ADP rankings so we could all be on the same page. Uh, so if you want to follow along, those are the rankings that we're looking at over at uh, NFBC. And within the first 15 picks, you two, who are you seeing there that you don't think you're going to be getting on any of your teams? Uh, let's start with Steve. I don't know if this is a good thing because when we were prepping for this and you know had our little group chat, uh, all three of us said Bobby Wood Jr. So uh, we're either going to be really smart or, or look really foolish. I don't know which way uh, it's going to go there, but um, it's something I've talked about, you know, on Wins Above Fantasy podcast. Just you know, talking fantasy baseball with other people. It's I get the appeal of Bobby Witt. I, I know that there's. there's 30 homer, 30 steel upside. It's the, the profile that looks like a prototypical first rounder for years to come. And I think he will be that eventually. I just don't want to do that before it actually happens, if that makes sense. Like, you know, I'd rather, I guess, be a year late than a year early, um, you know, to spend what uh, he is going at 775. So the seventh pick in, in draft champions right now. Um, 
to spend that on a guy that had a 99 WRC plus and a 722 OPS last year. Um, I'm not saying there won't be improvement, but you know, when, when you take a hitter in the first round, you'd like that OPS to start with a nine, uh, not a seven. So uh, it, it's, it's going to be tough for me to uh, have to, to take Bobby Witt and I, I won't be spending a seventh overall pick on him. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It seems like lots of risk uh, for reasons that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. But I also wanted to hear uh, Dave's opinion on this. So Dave, why we, you know, like Steve said, we all kind of agreed that Bobby Witt in those first 15 picks stuck out as an extra risky guy up there. Why did you have him up there too? Right. Similar to things that Steve had mentioned. Uh, one thing that comes out to me that uh, we talk a lot about the sophomore slump, which is truly just another way of saying the word regression. Um, he kind of overperformed a little bit. It's different. When I'm thinking about my first pick, I want this to be like as rock solid, can't miss, you know, and I'm not saying he can't take a step back or a step forward. There's just uh, there's a better, a better potential, potential that, you know, he's just not going to return that value, in my opinion. It's tough to pass on speed at the third base spot, but it is what it is. There's a couple things that kind of stand out and looking at the minor league stuff, he kind of walked a bit more. He didn't really strike out a whole ton, but when he comes up to the majors, you would expect him to strike out more than he did in the minors. He struck out less, you know, he didn't walk nearly as much. He walked way, way less. One of the, you know, only like a 4% walk rate. Um, All in all, it translated into some little bit of stuff with like his batting average, could be a ceiling of where we saw he's not going to be pushing i think that 300 batting average it's really just nitpicking small little things but it's enough for me to say i'll jump on something safer that would be the the biggest point yeah as they say floor early ceiling late right you draft Mm -hmm. your first couple of picks because of their floor because they give you a solid baseline because there are a lot of fun lottery tickets later in in the draft that you can take that give you really fun upside um, Bobby Witt's also a guy that I wrote about um, back in November, I believe, uh, in the Royal Sleeper and Bus article. And one thing that I picked out for him, like he's got amazing hand speed to get on balls inside. Uh, so his like whiff rate on balls like on the inside third quarter of the zone is negligible. He just he just does not miss pitches inside. So he's able to avoid strikeouts in that way. But when you talk about fastballs up, he chases it more often than league average and he whiffs more often than league average. And that got worse as the year went on, as pitchers started exploiting it more and more. And now he's there cemented in the middle of the lineup. He's expected to provide that power. Whereas last year, it was kind of like Salvador Perez was the middle of that lineup, the guy that they expected to be providing the power. And Perez is still there. But now Witt is, has those extra expectations on him. And I just don't see him now in his second year. He's still learning the ropes. Now being able to lay off that high fastball, a notoriously difficult pitch to lay off of, I, I, I don't see that. I see that getting worse. I see the strikeouts getting higher, as as you mentioned, Steve. And um, uh, just in general, as you mentioned, Dave, just that, that batting average being the ceiling, um, which – limits the counting stats too. If he's getting on base less, he's not getting to the plate as much. Um, he's not getting on base as much, not as many steals. Like all of that kind of funnels has, has a ripple effect. Um, yeah, so <laughs> if you've drafted Bobby Witt in the last week, sorry. Um, any, any other I don't think it's, I don't think it's yeah. like Spore is saying in the chat, like it's not a bad thing to take Bobby Witt in the first round. Like he mm-hmm. does have a season that is extremely productive under his belt. It's just, and I think he's going to improve. I think he's going to be a first rounder for years to come. It's just, I don't want to pass on Juan Soto, Jordan Alvarez, Mookie Betts to kind of wish cast those improvements, right? Like Mm -hmm. I'd rather take, you know, those guys uh, ahead of him, but it's not like a bad pick or, or anything like that. He, you know, he, he was, valuable last year so uh it, it's just uh i i think we're all in agreement that the value is too much to pass up on on these kind of other proven guys right yeah for sure if i can get mookie bets mookie bets was one of my favorites in uh yeah. in leagues last year just yeah. so safe felt so so safe with him 
Any other guys that you looked at in the first round that for those first 15 picks that you're you're more iffy on that you don't think you're going to get? Or should we move on to round two? I, I kind of like that area. Like, I, th- I think the first round's sort of deep. That's why I like, like drafting in the back end, the middle of the first rounds, right? Uh, this is the one that sort of stood out. So um, unless there's anything else you guys wanted to to bring up, I kind of like, uh, you know, I, I love that sweet spot of like pick eight to 15 maybe closer to eight range just to sort of double tap on the deepness of the first round so i think we yeah, could, no, could move on to who else we we hate no, real quick on it we did write up a a mock draft from earlier in the year like october and when mm-hmm. i posted it to reddit the comments like over and over were why is bobby wick going so early over and so even i think consensus was kind of wondering that too but yet here he is adp is dictating him that early mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, there. I despite seeing him in a bunch of bust articles, that we see all these like right. bust articles start coming out now that we're getting more and more accurate ADP data with more leagues that are being drafted that are closer to standard uh, standard rules. Bobby Witt's on a lot of them, but it doesn't <laughs> seem to be dissuading people. There still seems to be at least one person in every draft who says, "No, I think this is one of the best fantasy players in baseball this year." Um, so it's, it speaks to the upside, yeah. right? I, I yeah. think it's 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 just your sort of risk tolerance in the early first rounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so then let's move on to round. Let's open it up to more round two. Now we're looking at the first thirty picks. So guys who are going in the fifteen to thirty range. Anybody in there that you're definitely out on that you don't want to have on any of your teams? Let's start with Dave this time. All right. My pick almost goes in the first, and I was going with Manny Machado. Uh, there's a couple reasons, and I do see the reason to pull an early third baseman as it just kind of falls off a cliff, and so I think that's why they get bumped up. The problem I'm having is I really would rather prefer a guy like um, Austin Riley, which is just, I think, going to hammer all the, the home runs he can, and that's sort of like the back-end thing that I'm seeing with Machado is we saw a drop in, in Max EV. He didn't hit that many barrels per plate appearance. But yet, it, I don't want to say he didn't earn him because he is very prolific at hitting home runs. But again, when you're getting this close, you have to just nitpick these guys. And again, he overperformed his, his expected batting average. You know, instead of being near 300, he's pushing, you know, closer to 270. It's just it falls into little, little things. At this point, give me a guy like Austin Riley that, you know, probably has the potential of hitting 40 to 50 home runs uh, and mashing just as many of the counting stats as well. Yeah, I mean, one thing to say about Manny Machado is that hopefully now he has a full year of both Juan Soto and Fernando Tatis Jr. So we're looking at potentially an offense that's going to be coming around. Um, but San Diego, the ballpark there is pretty tough. So, sure. yeah, S- Steve, any what, what about uh, I, I, I'd give some pushback uh, on that Machado <laughs> uh, uh, fade there. And, you know, despite the fact that you know, Tatis is suspended, I think, what, for the first 20 games at least, and then yeah. had two off-season sh- surgeries. So um, no lock there, but, you know, Soto definitely should bounce back. I, I think um, it's always hard for a new player, even one of Juan Soto's caliber, uh, in a new environment for the first uh, first season. So I, w- I would expect some bounce back there. I think with Chato, you know, there was a lot of – MVP chatter. Uh, He did miss a little bit of time where, you know, he had that ankle injury that he probably should have went on the IL, but I think he has like a, an IL streak that he hasn't been on in however many years. Right. So he sort of just missed 14 games. Uh, I I had him in a lot of leagues last year and was hoping to get that IL destination and he just didn't do it. But um, I, I think he sort of went around this, this range last year and, kind of exceeded expectations. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, a 152 R WRC plus was the best of his career, you know, and that's after playing in Baltimore in a hitters friendly park for however many years, uh, you know, I know you, you're not going to expect the high thirties, even a 40 Homer total, but I think you could probably pencil in, you know, 280, 30 and the counting stats that, will be there because, you know, even without Tatis and without Soto for most of the year, he still had a hundred RBI, a hundred runs, 102 RBIs chipped in nine steals. And a lot of those came before that ankle injury too. Um, so, 
you know, uh, he's not going to be a zero in that department as well. So I like Machado. I, I think that he's kind of like this old, boring fringe first rounder that was kind of there last year and is essentially at the same price despite this really, really good year last year from Machado. So uh, I'll, I'll give some pushback there, Dave. And, you know, uh, there's some positivity too for uh, the negative uh, hour of PitchCon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I was also fine with Machado where he's going. I'm not going to push him any higher. Uh, but if you're talking about double tapping, if I get um, one of the good outfielders at the end, especially, or if I get some steals potential and I'm willing to um, not get any speed from third base here, uh, yeah, I'd be I'd be happy with Manny Machado in the second round as the second part of that double tap. Um, one guy that there, there, there are a couple of kind of controversial guys. We've got Tatis. I don't want to talk about Tatis right now. The other guy that I think other people are going to be bringing up, and I think I already saw his name come up in the chat, is Michael Harris. Michael Harris is another guy that's going to be going in this range that I think people are going to be either way in or way out on. I'm out, personally. Uh, I'm curious, and I'll, I'll talk about why in a minute, but I'm curious to hear what you two think. Are you in or out on Michael Harris at this price? <laughs> It's, it, I thought he was the obvious one in this round, which is somewhat why I chose um, Machado. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that a lot of been there's been a lot of talk about his splits. Um, I think there could be a platoon role. Still a very young player, very skills oriented that could put up a 2020 season. He's probably going to be one of those guys that everyone's asking, why is he in the second round um, and not a little bit later? So, yeah, I, I understand the pushback to this, too. Um, I think he has another gear, and I'm okay with where he's going in the second half, but uh, um, could be wrong. I, my biggest flaw when it's come to fantasy baseball is, like, falling for the, the shiny new toy. I remember, you know, after Jorge Soler had that, like, <laughs> unreal September in, like, 2014, I remember, like, setting the min on him in, in several leagues, and I, I – I fall for the 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 small sample young rookie all the time, and I've I've told myself this year that, you know, I need more safe and steady guys, especially in the early rounds. Harris is the guy that's going to give me the most trouble to stick to that advice that I'm giving myself, but I'm going to stick with it, and I agree that it should be a fade at this price. Um, the numbers versus lefties are concerning. The chase rate is concerning. Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of like the Bobby Witt of of the outfield, um, just, you know, later in the second, early third round. So it, it, it's it's sort of too, it's too risky for, for for my taste or at least what I'm trying to practice this year. So, uh, uh, yeah, as as Paul said, says in the, the chat, I have a shiny new toy syndrome, so I'll, I'll hope to cure that. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, this year by staying away from Michael Harris, at least at that price. Again, I think that, you know, this is another guy that might be a first rounder for years to come, but, you know, let someone else find that out and make a, a good pick if, if that is the case um, and, and get something a little bit safer, you know, uh, going around him, like, you know, even like Lindor or Simeon that kind of provide that power speed profile that have just done it for, a lot longer and you can kind of know what you can expect and don't necessarily have that uh, platoon risk. Not that Harris is going to get platooned, but his numbers versus lefties are a bit concerning. I mean, he's still just 21. So there's definitely some growing pains that have to happen um, despite him coming up from double a, right. He, he skipped triple mm -hmm. a last year. So, uh, and this is someone that, that scooped him everywhere he could last year when, when he first came up and, you know, reaped the benefits. Uh, so, um, I agree. It should be a fade. Yeah, and that, that shiny new toy syndrome in, in standard 5x5 five five fantasy gets like two or three times worse when steals are involved. When it's yes. a shiny new player and they're like, whoa, 25 steal potential, they shoot up the boards, uh, regardless of the underlying numbers. And I, I'm you mentioned the chase rate. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the walks. I'm looking at the quality of contact. And I saw a good hitter, uh, but I didn't see a great hitter yet um, um so yeah in terms of guys that you could replace them with uh these are two flawed players in them in themselves but they come with lower price points cedric mullins um i think often the offense in uh, baltimore is going to be better you know he's 
you know, quality of contact is not great. He's not the power numbers are definitely faulty, you know, shaky, but he gives you some power speed. Um, Adalas Garcia has the swing and miss problems. He's uh, got an average issue, but he also gives you that power speed. So, I I would become more comfortable drafting Michael Harris around there. Guys who have this power speed potential, but are flawed. They have a, they each have kind of a flaw that you have to balance with uh, with the rest of your team. So. I would be more comfortable drafting him around there, which is a solid two rounds later. Yeah. So anybody else uh, in those first 30 before I open it up even further? No, not necessarily. No. Those are the two that's right. at least, you know, okay. that stood out to me was definitely Harris. And then uh, yeah. I want to put something, something else spicy in there for the second round with Machado. Right. Great. So let's open it up even further. Let's go out to the first three rounds, the first, 45 so picks 30 to 45 or 50 ish um so in the third round the picks 30 to 45 who are you seeing there um let's start with steve again yeah uh i, I kind of went a little unorthodox here and kind of just put something that i i, I like to do an overall strategy uh I, I don't like paying up for the high high end uh sp ones and especially those with injury risk. So guys like Jacob DeGrom and Shane McClanahan, I am just going to be out on. Um, my best call from last off season was Shane McClanahan. I was drafting him as a, as an SP one, uh, you know, through the first half of the season that, you know, made me look good in a lot of leagues. He was still okay in the second half, then got hurt. Um, so that's the biggest concern with me for him there. Uh, you know, the, the price does not reflect that he had, a shoulder injury where there was video of him like crying, walking off of his bullpen session. Uh, as I watched that live, as I was in a playoff matchup needing that start, I believe I was crying as well uh, seeing that happen. So, um, you know, he came back, which is, which is encouraging. Um, but the last four starts, he didn't go past five innings, didn't get more than five strikeouts. And then if you look at the window even further, um, in the second half, he had 55 innings pitched, a 420 ERA, a 20% strikeout rate, and that strikeout rate was 35.7% in the first half. That shows you, you know, how good he can be and how big the drop off was. Uh, his K minus BB, which is a great in season predictor, in the first half was 31.1%. In the second half, it was 12.2%. So the strikeouts went way down, walks went way up. Um, and I don't think that risk is sort of priced in. I know the overall line on McClanahan looks great. Um, he's one of my favorite players and pitchers to watch, so I hate doing that. Um, but I just won't be in at that third round price. And then DeGrom, it's just, you know, if you look at the projections, right, it, it, he, you know, you plug in any projection system into like an auction calculator, DeGrom is like the number one value. But how could you project DeGrom for 160 innings? The, the, the innings totals the last three years are 64, 92, and 68. I know that 68 is kind of cherry picking because it was a shortened season, but still, I mean, he hasn't thrown more than 92 innings in three years. So uh, I just cannot pay for pitching that high and especially pitchers that have a recent injury history. Yeah, we see we see several really interesting pitchers here in this range. So you have Degrom, who's technically twenty nine right now. Yeah. So, um, and then second Spencer round ish kind of. Yeah, Spencer Strider's in here at thirty one, uh, and we get Shane McClanahan here at forty one, and then to a certain extent Carlos Rodon at forty two. Around this time last year, uh -huh. we were wondering whether Rodon had the uh, ability to go a full season. So this is kind of the the area where you're seeing that. A lot of these pitchers have had stretches of at least a few months where they were pitching like the best pitcher in baseball. Uh, McClanahan in the first half of last year, I think he was the leader among starters for strike amount of walk percentage, for FIP, for um, so many so many things. And then DeGrom, he, whenever he's been on the last few years, he's been clearly the best pitcher. Um, but there's a ton of risk here. So I am also out on most of these guys. Shane, uh, maybe... Yeah, I'd say probably all of these guys as well. Dave, what do you think? Do, do, are you drafting any of these pitchers, or, or are you out on them too? No, I mean, it depends. Whenever I draft, I'm usually uh, – a rule of thumb for me is whatever the room's drafting for pitchers plus one. I like to grab early pitchers is, is sort of my thing. 
And um, it's funny, the ones that you've like named so far, I really haven't been the ones that I've been kind of going. I've been pushing up more like a, like a Wheeler or Woodruff, um, something in there. And I have been trying to avoid that injury somewhat laden risk. Um, I have been known to take a DeGrom or two as um, if Spencer Strider showed us anything, it's the number of innings doesn't necessarily mean you can't mm-hmm. be productive. Um, and Shane McClanahan, while being injured and having that issue, uh, would not surprise me if he came back and was just uh, dominating. But it's a risk you're going to take. So um, if it was my second one, it, it would be really risky. But for me, it's usually like, uh, you know, uh, usually I'm three pitchers by the fourth round. So I'm trying to get less of, of the injuries and just build up a big bank. Yeah, it could go the other way too, right? Like remember last offseason, everyone was super concerned about Wheeler. I think mm-hmm. he had like a shoulder injury announced in like December. And then, you know, he was kind of like, yep, I'm fine. It's good. And went to spring training fully healthy. Like if McClanahan goes into spring training and is, you know, touching 100 and his slider and changeups look, look like the first half again, like, you know, that, that will definitely ease my concern. But in drafts right now, I can't do that until I have that uh, sort of reassurance. <clears throat> sure. Yeah, for, for me, I, I I mentioned four pitchers, and uh, the guy that I see is definitely the one that I want to take out of them is Carlos Rodon. Um, Rodon, for me, quelled all of the volume concerns last year, and he's going last, fourth out of these four. He's going 43rd overall right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but Rodon got better in the second half. His fastball velocity dropped by like one mile an hour, but his results on that fastball improved. He had, among qualified pitchers, the highest uh, strikeout minus walk percentage, uh, outdone among like all starters only by DeGrom and Strider, who didn't reach the qualifying uh, innings. Um, Rodon threw like the seventh most pitches in the league last year. So yeah, he was a little inefficient, but in terms of pitch volume, he was among the workhorses last year, despite that 178 innings like overall. So. Yes, switching to New York, a slightly more homer-friendly environment than San Francisco, but the run environment for me is just as it's like fine. Um, so if I'm being a lefty am, in Yankee, yeah. sta- being a lefty in Yankee Stadium is better too, right? And he has the platoon mm-hmm. advantage against those lefties with the short porch there. So yeah, so uh, I I'm avoiding the the Degrom Striders uh, McClanahan's at that round, but I'm taking the Rodon there. So. I'm with you on that. I think that's a good good fallback. I, I could see myself having a lot of road down chairs as well. Yep, yep. Uh, okay, so let me open it up even more uh, to guys that the draft, you know, the market is saying do have some flaws that are pushing their draft stock beyond uh, ADP 50. So now let's look at the next. Um, we'll do one more where we're just doing one round at a time and then we'll kind of expand it out Mm -hmm. from there. So now let's look from uh, about pick 45 to 60. Um, Do you see anybody in there that you're definitely out on? Uh, Dave, let's start with you. All right. The one that I wanted to touch on and I'm just already um, like off season hyped out of like uh, Corey Seager. Like it feels like every time I turn on a podcast and every time I read something, all I hear is how he's going to destroy the shift and it's going to make him the super athlete that just goes to another level. I don't know if it's just the market's pushing him up just far too much because everyone's talking about him. He's still a middle infielder with just no speed who prior to last year, we always talked about being injured. Um, He did come into a new place and, and perform. So I get kind of what's going on. Um, the way I'm constructing a team, just a middle infielder needs to have some kind of speed and not just be entirely power based um, for how it's going. And and maybe it's just how I'm constructing teams, but at that range, I'm probably either jumping earlier for somebody who can do a little bit of everything at a shortstop or just waiting as the position is quite deep. Yeah. Steve, what do you think? Um, I like Corey Seager. I I do. I totally get, um, how you would need to approach it. And I think that maybe the the shift is probably bumping him up uh, a little bit further than it needs to be. Um, you know, how you need to approach it, you need to have your speed somewhere else, right? Because if you don't get it from shortstop or middle and field, uh, you need to have, you know, an outfielder that you could count on for 20 or so bags or something like that, or just a position that you wouldn't 
expect to get uh, your speed from. And I mean, I, I know it's not everything, but and maybe it was just adjusting to a new team. But Corey Seager was pretty bad, I think, in, in April and May, and then really turned it on. Um, and you know, a, a, a reason why I think I like him is that that two forty two BABIP just sticks out like a sore thumb. Like I don't think that that is repeatable just from a guy that has, you know, posted BABIPs in the 330s, 350s uh, earlier in his career, always around 300 or, or more. Uh, and I think that that might be more of like a correlation than a causation. And if, if he does have a bump in batting average um, because of the shift, right? Like it might not necessarily be right um, if he does have a boost in batting average. So uh, I, I understand it. I, I know that y- you want, um, you know, steals from there, and you would need a a, a backup plan um, if you don't get that from the middle infield. So um, I, I like Corey Seager. I, I understand why you would want to go elsewhere and, and get a guy like you know maybe Lindor earlier who's going to chip in ten to fifteen stolen bases, something like that, or you know uh, whoever else uh, to get from your middle infielder to probably add that speed because you need to do that early in the in the rounds. You need to get those like five category contributors, especially in deeper leagues or, or, you know, uh, even your five by five standard leagues too. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like you said, Steve, I can see based on like how the first three rounds go for me, I can see a situation where I'm like, I I have to fade Corey Seager here because I have to value steals a little bit more. Um, So I can certainly see team builds where I'd be like, "Mm, I got to fade him a little bit Uh, just to on the, Zooming out to, you know, is this a guy I refuse to draft? No, there's definitely other team bills where I'd be happy to have Corey Seeker at that price. So, uh, yeah, for me, it depends on team build uh, as well. Um, Steve, did you have anybody else in that uh, 45 to 60 range that you are refusing to draft at that price? Um, this is a little bit earlier. Um, it's more around like pick 40, um, mm-hmm. but still, I think technically round four and uh, like a 12 tweamer. So uh, that's Randy Rosarena. Um, it's just someone that I've constantly faded. I've been wrong a million years in a row, uh, you know, after the hot playoffs, I didn't think, uh, you know, that was repeatable. And he still was a, a pretty good fantasy player last year. Uh, I didn't buy him at the price and he put up uh, what uh, 23, 35 season, something like that. So it was well worth it. Um, I don't want to be caught, you know, with a hot potato uh, on Randy Rose Arena, and I'm not drafting him because of that, right? The the flaws are all there. You know, it's not a second round pick. The market is telling you he's flawed a little bit, like like you've been saying. But you know, the X stats are just so scary. The 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 lack of walks, uh, the swing strike, all, all of that. Um, despite the 20, 30 upside, like he he reached last year. Um, and I just think, you know, th- there's a there's a risk with the speed, too. He was caught 12 times. I know there's bigger base paths, so that should help him. But that red light could come at any moment from an analytically sound team like the Rays. So um, to have that sort of amount of caught stealings running through that many outs on the base path, that could come at any time. And especially uh, as you get older, right, if you lose a step, that can come any year without without warning so uh a rosarena will continue to be my a fade i will fade him every year until he is either bad or retired and i'm right so one of these years i will be right <laughs> eventually one day yeah um yeah with a rosarena at 37 it's it's another example of that, that steals bump yeah. um we tend to overvalue steals in a lot of in, in a lot of um league situations uh when we don't have to we in order to win like a roto league, you don't have to be first in the seals. You just have to get enough um, and then be good and everything else. That's at least my philosophy that I, I have enjoyed. Um, and it allows me to not have to push a guy up like Rosarena, uh, who has got a lot of flaws as a hitter, just because he can give you 30 steal. Um, so I, I would agree with you there. I, I tend to fade steals a little bit more than the general market. Um, just because I want good hitters on my team, first and foremost. Um, all right, so let's let's expand it out even more. So we've talked about the first 60 picks. Let's expand it out to the first 80 picks or so. So we'll kind of expand it by a little more so we can get 
hopefully through the whole the whole draft. So in the first 80 picks now, so now we're looking specifically at picks 60 to 80, uh, who stands out to you as somebody who shouldn't be there, who you're not going to have on your drafts, um, on, on your team? So let's go back to Dave. Um, you know, one of them that jumps out towards the end here, I, I really am, am not finding myself drafting much Teoscar Hernandez. Um, I don't particularly love the move over there to Seattle. I really liked him more so in, in a much, I feel like we could all agree, maybe is a more powerful lineup that should probably score a few more runs, even though Seattle looks like they're trending in a, in a good way. Um, I just think that, you know, looking at him, there's a good chance. I think the, the steals are going to come down quite a bit. Um, I think he's going to probably get a, a few less at bats in, in this lineup, you know, potentially. And it doesn't look like his speed is trending necessarily in the exact right way. And I think 12, two years ago was kind of pushing it because he volumized his way there. Then it went down to six and he's got less. This is a guy who's often injured as well. Um, and he just like never hits that 600 plate appearance sort of thing. It's just like he kind of meanders around, you know, 500. And um, it's still kind of early. And if I'm going to get uh, an outfielder, you're going to have to provide me like all these things. Love the amount of co- the quality of contact. The guy just crushes baseballs, which is a beautiful thing. Um, the unfortunate thing is I just don't think it'll be enough based on his ADP for me. Yeah, right now the bat X projecting him at 603 plate appearances and 10 steals, which the 603 plate appearances would be a career high. Uh, and then the 10 steals would be second only to 2021. Um, in all the other leagues, he's had you know five or six, you know, noting that the six in 2020 was just in 50 games. So kind of on pace more for a mid-teens um, year there. So yeah, the bat X projecting that speed to come back and projecting a career high uh, in plate appearances. So definitely something to keep an eye on. Um, Steve, what about, uh, what about you? Anybody in that 60 to 80 range that you're out on real quick on, on Teoscar? I mean, okay. I know it was a different situation, but look at what happened to Jesse Winker when he, when he moved to, mm. you know, from a hitter friendly environment to, uh, T-Mobile park there. Uh, it's, it's not a great place to hit. I don't think it's good for, um, average for power for, for anything like that. So, uh, it, it, it I, I agree. I, I don't know if I'm going to be having, uh, as much Tay Oscar as, I, as I've had in the past. Um, so um, I, this isn't mine. This is one of yours, but I wanted to talk about it because it's a guy that I really like uh, on, on the list uh, at ADP 83 around the pick 80. Uh, that's Tristan mm-hmm. McKenzie. Uh, I really like him. Okay. So I'm interesting to hear your yeah. perspective as I think uh, we're waiting for Dave to get added back in. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to talk about Tristan McKenzie a little bit. So, there we go. Uh, McKenzie. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I, I accidentally back. meant to hit the mute button and, and left. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no worries. We're all good. We're all good. Um, so we're just talking about Tristan McKenzie because I think we've all had uh, guys where we've had guys where we all agreed, but fade him. Uh, but we've also had guys where we were uh, in disagreement. So uh, it sounds like Tristan McKenzie is one in disagreement and I'm on the negative side here. So for me, like with, for a guy with a 6% walk rate last year, his command is actually pretty shaky. Um, his fastball and curve were good, but he gets hit really hard, you know, like almost a 10% barrel rate, 10, 10th percentile average exit velocity. Um, if, if you're looking for a guy to give you volume innings and good ratios, um, you're generally not wanting that kind of volatility uh, that is going to come with getting hit so hard. He, I don't think he misses enough bats to be able to get away long term with a 10% barrel rate. And I don't think his slider is necessarily that good to like that it's going to take a step forward uh, and make his fastball and curveball better. Um, so I'm, uh, I, I think the, the hard contact starts coming back to bite him a little bit. Um, so for, for a guy around that area, who's also going to give me the volume, um, you know, if McKenzie isn't going to blow you away with strikeouts, but if you're going to, if you're willing to sacrifice a few more strikeouts, I, I like Logan Webb. Um, you know, I, I compare it to, you know, just McKenzie's like junk food. It's, it, it's super, it looks, it sounds tasty and it sounds great. Those first few bites are delicious, but then over the long term, it's not too great, um, as a snack. Logan Webb is like celery with uh, natural peanut butter. 
it's you know it it's so it's a little more bland but you can have it every day you know you can have it every day if you want it's a great snack and you know he's going to give you those 55 60 percent ground balls it's going to be so steady um the park's great too uh so in that range i am not taking a guy that has the volatility of mckenzie and i'd much much rather have the stability of logan webb that's that's what i was thinking there Give me the junk food, man. I love junk food. Who doesn't love junk food? You know, that's it. your mom, when you're a kid, hands you celery and peanut butter. Come on. You know, I, no, I'm sneaking back into the cabinet for an Oreo or something, at least after. So, um, no, but I, I understand that. Um, I just think McKenzie sort of did everything that we were skeptical of last year, at least, you know. Uh, the volume was like the number one thing, right? Like he's the skinny stick figure uh, spore build um, to, uh, you know, that, that no one projected would get to 190 innings. And he did last year. He did. Um, to be fair, you know, the slider was pretty bad. Um, it was a 11 in run value. So positive. That's, that's bad. Um, the fastball was amazing, a negative 17 run value. And that still just, you know, sums it up by results. So it's not the best thing uh, to look at, but it still, you know, shows how, how you did. Uh, in previous years, the slider was at least average. Um, being in Cleveland is, is something that I think, you know, I put stock in. I like taking pictures there. You know, I, I like the, the way that they're de- able to develop, especially at the major league level. Like we saw things that happened with, with Shane Bieber and how he grew, um, you know, uh, they seem to get the most out of these guys. So I would bet on an improvement um, in the breaking stuff uh, from uh, McKenzie. And that's kind of why I'm in on it. And he does have, you know, two pitches that he can go to and the curveball that he uses 22% of the time and the slider that he uses 22% of the time. So if one of those takes a step to go with that elite fastball, I think that there could be an even further breakout as far as the strikeouts go. So um, that's my pushback pushback there. I know that, you know, not to invalidate everything you you said, I I understand that there could be safer plays at this range. Uh, I think that McKenzie just has a nice hint of upside uh, at, at that price. Like, you know, a guy that I kind of could take as an SP two, three, that, I could talk myself into, you know, this guy maybe has SP one upside if, 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 and that's a big, if, if one of those breaking balls uh, takes a, takes a, a, a step. So. Okay. Yeah. Dave, any comments on Tristan McKenzie? You want to throw another player out there? No, I mean, a quick comment with uh, Tristan McKenzie. I think one of the issues I just have is the guy just gives up. So it's a guy I, I like either playing against or playing when I'm using DFS because he just gives up. He like, puts nothing on the ground. Everything is in the air. So he can be susceptible to just getting crushed if guys are hitting the ball well against him and he's just not spotting things right. It could become pretty hazardous to him. Um, that being said, he showed us what we were kind of looking for, the innings mm-hmm. and um, the stability to give us those those extra Ks. I mean, he certainly can rack them up too. So, I, again, I can go either way. And for me, it's just going to come down to how I'm constructing a team for how I'm drafting him. So it puts it in a, a state of maybe I'll take him, maybe I won't in that case. It's not necessarily someone that I – I don't think anyone we've talked about I wouldn't take, but it's just blah to me, um, mm-hmm. to be honest. All right. Uh, so fair. So, Davey, make it take it here. You want to throw out our next player, uh, another guy in that 60 to 80 range or maybe just outside of that uh, that you're definitely not going to be taking? Oh, uh, in the 60 to 80s. <sighs> Let's see who did I grab down like here. Like round five uh, or six, yeah. Trying to see who I wrote down. Let's start with like um, just a guy that like I'm not taking regardless, and that's Byron Buxton, <laughs> right? Just I, he might be out of it. I don't even know which where his ADP is at the moment, um, but I wrote him down. There's just so many reasons I don't think I can take him, and um, he has the injury risk. The speed has just started to just absolutely diminish. He had knee surgery. The plate discipline is just horrible. Like when we talk about this guys we refuse there is not an adp i can almost find myself finding a reason that i need to take um byron buxton so that's why i want to throw him out there is like if there's like one stampid guy that is not going to end up on my team and i get that he like could have hit 50 home runs last year I, I see it but there is so much of this profile that's just awful based on the adps i've seen 
Yeah, Byron Buxton right now uh, in the DC leagues that we we mentioned from Jan in January, going right now at one twelve overall. All right, so, so way quite, late, but yeah, quite yeah, quite a bit cheaper than last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Steve, any comments on Byron Buxton? Uh, he was my first bold prediction to win an MVP last year. I think that was like, <laughs> the most popular bold prediction, like across anyone that ever wrote in a bold prediction article. You know, um, so uh, I, I was pretty wrong there. Uh, I do, I could talk myself back in on the price. Um, but I think what Dave, what you said too, is a big factor. Like a reason why I liked him and everyone liked him is because you would have thought that there could be some speed, but it's almost like, you know, you can't expect really any steals from him just because they just don't want him running at all because of how often he's injured. So, um, that's just another thing that, you know, I think, we didn't adjust for last year or at least expect on that sort of hype train. And now we kind of have that data. So mm -hmm. um, despite, I think it being at least a decent value, you know, if you have, it's a, it's another thing like Seager, right? Like if you have all of these steady and, uh, you know, another options in the outfield guys that, you know, are, are, are safer, you know, maybe you could take that high upside play of bucks and, but it's really, really on a specific build. So, um, I, I'm with you on that. And with how often I've been burned by bucks in the past, I can't say I disagree. I, I think if we are to make an argument in favor of Buxton, uh, it would be that the acquisition of Michael A. Taylor will allow them to play him, just DH him more. Um, mm -hmm. If he's if they see him as the full-time center fielder, then yeah, I, there's no way he makes it through the full season. Center field mm -hmm. at major league level is the most grueling position. Um, but right now, Nick Gordon is projected at DH. I don't see Nick Gordon DHing. You know, I'm looking at um, roster resource on fan graphs. Uh, Nick Gordon at DH. I don't. I don't see that happening a whole lot. Uh, they got Trevor. He played Lord some out. center last year, last year too, right? So they they have yeah. that option. Got rid of Arias. That sort of cleared up Kirilov for first base. I think they said he's healthy. Yeah. So. Yeah. If Kirilov's wrist stops breaking mm -hmm. every season. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's uh, I, I could certainly see Gordon playing some center, uh, Michael A. Taylor playing some center, and Buxton DHing more. Uh, so if we get to opening day and Buxton is their starting DH, does that change things for you? Um, you know, no. it's just so it's so tough because he's so good in the outfield, right? Yeah, you know, like how like I understand you want to keep him healthy, but a lot of his value comes from gold gloves defense in the outfield. So it's a hard thing to balance, right? Like, yeah, I'm sure Isn't they this... want to do everything to get him as much center field time while also keeping him healthy. It's kind of like a damp if you do damn if you don't sort of mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. I definitely agree that uh, the projection systems anywhere from like nine to 11 steals. I do not buy no. that at all. Yeah. I Same. do not buy agree. any of that. Yeah. Agree. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of moved down. That was the ADP 112. Let's go back uh, a little bit. Um, and I'm going to throw out a guy who is uh, going to be controversial <laughs> because he's also nice, going to be, like it. He's, uh, also gonna be like what a lot of people are projecting as a league winner this year, and that is O'Neill Cruz. Um, I Ray just did on the uh, on the last panel. I think he, yeah, he got it yeah, really up for, for Cruz. Now let's throw some cold water on it. Yeah, there's going to be a Neil Cruz fan, like fans all up and down uh, fantasy, the fantasy baseball community. I understand that uh, 122 mile an hour line drive. Like nobody <laughs> does that, right? There's crazy raw power. Um, but, you know, if you're looking at the, the projections, it is already baking in improvements, right? So I, I, def I always clock that. Uh, it is already baking in into the like raw projections, baking in improvements in plate discipline, um, which, yeah, you saw improvements towards the end of last year. But gosh, if you're starting to say, oh, in September, he started to trend up. You're talking about like 90 plate appearance mm -hmm. sample sizes. You know, that's tough. Um, so if you even if you like build, bake in that improvement, uh, if I'm looking at ATC projections, he's being uh, and like plug it into the auction calculator. That's the 12th overall shortstop. Uh, so the, and it's like neck and neck with Wander Franco. Uh, and Wander Franco right now is going 92. And then O'Neill Cruz right now is going 78. So we got a 15 pick premium 
in addition to the improvements that the projection systems are already baking in. So I, I guess this is people who are, you're either, if you're in on O'Neill Cruise, you're way in. I think that's what the market is saying. If you have to be way in on O'Neill Cruise to want it. And like with all of the swing and miss problems that we had, like 34% strikeouts. Ugh. And I know people are going to be like, well, the raw, the raw like ability is there. I get that, but you got to time it right. And uh, I don't necessarily trust the pirates to get the best out of him immediately. So yeah, I'm not going to be taking O'Neill Cruz because I think if you do take O'Neill Cruz on, on this year, you have to be thinking that he is a first round pick next year. Like that, you have to be that in on him. Yeah, that that you're not drafting O'Neill Cruz at pick, you know, 75 because you think he's going to be the 75th best player. You're drafting him there because you think he's going to be a top 15 player, which Gray last hour gave the case for him to be that. And there is a case, I think, right? It's just, uh, you know, Old so, me, shiny new toy syndrome me, uh, believed that and fell for that. And like you said, like the projections are pretty good. Like the bat, like ATC has him at 25 homers, 17 steals, uh, you know, 245, 310, 456. Like that's pretty good, but that's not what you're going to need if you take him at this price, right? Um, you're going to hope that it's like you know, 260. 30 20 or you know 35 20 something like that you know which it's capable he's capable of it like you know he has the stat cast and the raw ability to do that it's just he's got to fix those other flaws and it's sort of the overall theme right like i'm probably going to let someone else find out and take that gamble until he does prove that uh, and if he does good for that person on that team you'll, you know it'll be a great pick uh, you tip your cap um but i i understand the risk and like you said, a 90 at bat sample in September of him cutting down the swing and miss is not enough. All right. So real quick on, on O'Neill Cruz. One, I think one of the issues with his projections is um, he's basically slated to only play 130 games. There is no way the Pirates yeah. are going to take him out of the lineup. This guy is probably pushing 150 to 155 games easy. He's either going to be there playing 150 games right. or, or in the minors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he might. He might. Yeah. Say he sticks around all year, and instead of batting, like, projections put him loosely at, like, the 500, 525 bat, at-bats, right? And, and we push him up to more, like, 600, 650 at-bats. I am understanding the Pirates have nothing to lose but to put this guy in the best of bets pitching and watch him go, right? At that point, you're looking at a guy who's going to average something more like, you know, just – extrapolating the, the the ATC and you, you, you putting them all together. 89 runs, 27 home runs, 80 RBIs, and 21 stolen bases with a 240 batting average. That's what I think people are kind of taking the draft on. If you're looking at just kind of where they're pushing him and maybe they're baking in, he's only going to play in 130 games based on what do you play in last year? 87. You know, I that might be where we're seeing a little bit of discrepancy. Um, would I draft him? I'm not, <laughs> but I can understand why some would get there. I would love a little bit more of a um, an ADP discount, but the shiny new toy is never going to let yep. that happen. So I totally understand it. Will I draft O'Neill Cruz? Absolutely, because of a 122 mile per hour hit. <laughs> like we just don't know. There is a wild card aspect that could be second round talent. He will end up on teams, but I kind of understand what you're. I totally get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, you know, he, he's guys we refuse to draft at the price point. Yeah. I don't hate him, I don't hate him as a player, I don't hate him as a prospect. He he's going to be real exciting to watch. Um, but like I the said, price gonna go up. the price is going to go up, the price is going to go up too. Is more it's drafts only going to go up, it's, it's only, only going to go up. Yeah. yeah, so there's no way I'm drafting O'Neill Cruz based on all the hype that is going to be surrounding <laughs> him going into March. Um, so we've only got a few minutes left here. So I'll just open it up to the whole board. Last player that you want to throw out. Any last player that you throw out that you're definitely not drafting this year that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, Steve, why don't you go first? I think this is one of your names on the list, but it's also on my do not draft list. list. That is Jake Miles Straw McCarthy. Um, <laughs> I am was out on Straw last year, sort of that steel only profile. And I think that... McCarthy is bumped up because of that, that profile, right? Like, you know, there's a chance that this isn't a major league 
bat in, in here. Uh, I know the steal numbers were great and he, he did contribute across the board and other categories too, but all of the underlying metrics are, are, are pretty concerning a 4.8% barrel, barrel rate, um, you know, a 74.4% contact rate isn't great. So uh, I think a lot of things went well on a really bad Arizona team for him last year. And that outfield is pretty crowded there. So, you know, if he starts off in a slump, like, that playing time will dry up. And so, you know, what you, what a lot of people are penciling in for 30 steals. So we saw what happened with Miles Straw last year. I think that's a cautionary tale. Uh, I will not be drafting uh, a speed only guy in uh, McCarthy. Yeah. Especially going at what these like in the mid twenties outfield, like 26th overall outfield or something like that. And yeah. he hasn't, to me, he hasn't even proven that he's an even average major league hitter. Uh, that's, that's definitely tough that's a tough yeah the mile straw cop might be tough that's that's really really bad hitter that's like Mm -hmm. you know 50 wrc plus 60 wrc plus and i know mccarthy was was pretty good last year by by those metrics but it's still a steel only guy right i i I, I agree i don't think it's a great bad at that price point 100 steven kwan over him um yeah yeah yeah. dave last last player to throw out there all right last player and this is just maybe just very price related um, I'm not going to find myself taking an Joe Ryan. It's one of these things for me. Uh, this guy is just super hyper reliant on a fastball. Um, when you're throwing that many fastballs, and I understand he's got sort of like a different build. He's coming in at a different angle. But as better see this more, they're going to get more used to him. Um, he gives up like no ground balls. He's like 199th in ground balls. Like everything is in the air with this guy. Um, and it's, Again, part of this is based off of price. I think you're having to take him in like the 10th round. I'm just going to wait and take pictures much later because I don't think he's really going to give us – I look at him as more of a guy who's going to teeter around that four ERA as opposed to kind of where he was at. I think he just kind of got a, a little bit lucky on it. and um, Could be wrong. I know he's kind of been somewhat of a sexy name, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. I see the guy, the starter going right next to him, Jesus Lazardo, and I am in love exactly. with Jesus Lazardo. I would uh, I draft him over over Ryan every day. Um, three last players for me, kind of later on in drafts. Alexis Diaz wrote about him in my Red Sleepers and Bus. He relies on high fastballs, but doesn't have elite velocity. The homers are going to come. Uh, think Alex Reyes, twenty twenty one. A blow up could happen. Um, Frankie Montas shoulder injury going into the year. All combined with the splitter volatility no thanks uh alberto mondesi he's gonna get playing time in the in the red sox but don't forget that he's not a good hitter and he's coming off of acl injury he's on the the plant leg when he's a uh, when he's facing righties um that's going to be his plant leg, like his back leg 70 percent of the time um he's already got a 74 wrc plus career um against against righties and now he's going to have to have his back leg as is uh, the acl leg which it historically has a 12 percent reduction in performance um so speed might not be there and speed is all he gives you so no on mondesi as well yep yeah, mondesi tore his acl on like a pickoff attempt something that i i i remember watching that live and just could not believe like only this guy could tour tear his acl on a pickoff attempt it wasn't like yeah. a diving play in the infield or a uh you know uh, sprinting down to beat out a, a single or something like that it was it was a pickoff attempt it summed up mondesi's injury risk perfectly yeah and you know even if you could guarantee 130 games for me from mondesi i'm not taking him nick <laughs> hi hey what's going on guys i joe ryan i understand the slider we think is getting better um but being a flyball pitcher isn't so bad i really like that you said 199th uh dave because that shows that you're on a, the pitcherless player pages and i can't thank you for that <laughs> enough um but steve eric dave fantastic panel thank you guys so much i will be avoiding all of those guys especially tristan mckenzie absolutely um in drafts this season thanks so much for being a part of PitchCon. one more time just uh tell everybody the stuff that you do eric Hi. Uh, so yeah, I'm Eric. I work on the reliever team, so I'll be doing reliever ranks uh, weekly. So you can you got my Twitter there at Eric Dadman, and uh, keep reading Pitcherless. <laughs> cool, Steve. Uh, you can find my work uh, at Pitcherless as well uh, every week on the Winds Above Fantasy Podcast on the uh, Pitcherless Podcast Network. Uh, it's a lot of fun with my co-host Van Burnett. So uh, be sure to check it out. Awesome, and Dave. Yep. Yeah, so uh, fantasy. 
content manager at Pitcher List. I write a little bit of everything everywhere and uh, uh, just donate to ALS, guys. Good cause. <laughs> what Dave said. Mm -hmm. There you go. All right. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this. Yeah. Thanks, right, thank Nick. You.